Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This video shows the view from Parker Solar Probe back in August as it fell close towards the sun, setting a record as the fastest object ever built by humans. 147 kilometers per second, about 20 times the velocity of a spacecraft orbiting the Earth. But moreover, having analyzed the data that it sent back, they believe this is the first spacecraft to actually touch the sun. Now that's quite a sensational claim, and I think it's important to explain what they really mean when they say it has touched the sun. Because obviously, the spacecraft hasn't crashed into the sun, it's flown through a portion of the sun which is somehow distinct to the space around it. Now it isn't what a casual observer might think of as the surface of the sun. If you cast your eyes skywards and look at the sun, then you probably shouldn't do that because it's not good for your eyes. But if you view it under suitable conditions with filters or close to sunset, you can see a well-defined circular disk of the sun about half a degree across. And that is what I imagine most people think of as the surface of the sun. But unlike the surface of the earth, there is no transition from like a rarefied atmosphere to a hard piece of rock. The sun's atmosphere just gets thicker and thicker as you go down. And what we see as the surface is really the photosphere, the region where most of the light is emitted. And it's only a few hundred kilometers thick. It's amazing how thin this region is. It's the area where the plasma that makes up the sun goes from being optically thick to optically thin. Below the photosphere, the photons that get admit emitted tend to get reabsorbed, but in this last few hundred kilometers, suddenly they're able to travel far enough and escape into space. And a big contributor to this opacity change is that the plasma at this point is cool enough and dense enough that the electrons are interacting with the nuclei and therefore it increases the ability for the plasma to emit black body radiation. So the temperature of the sun's photosphere is about 5800 Kelvin, but the density of the atmosphere there is a small fraction of 1% of what we have on the Earth. It's tiny. The finite thickness of the photosphere also leads to a phenomenon called limb darkening. That is, when you take a simple white light photo of the sun, then it's brighter in the middle and fades out towards the edges. This is because towards the edges of the sun, the photons are having to come out of the atmosphere at lower and lower angles, and therefore they have to come up from higher and higher, where the atmosphere is in turn cooler and cooler. In the middle, you're looking straight down deeper into the hotter parts of the photosphere. This is a really simple photo I took with a regular camera and a sun filter. But of course, there's a lot of details that you can't see. If you look at the surface of the sun in extreme detail, then you see this granular structure. And if you watch them over time, you actually see these granules moving and merging. This is essentially convection. You've got hot gas that's bubbling up and cold gas that's sinking down. And the difference between the hot spots and the cold spots is you know, probably about a couple of thousand Kelvin, but because black body radiation law says that the amount of energy coming out goes as the fourth power of the temperature, there's a significant difference in brightness over this range. But don't go thinking that those dark areas are cool. They're still hot enough to melt practically any material you might have. I mean, maybe hafnium carbide might survive until it found one of the hotter spots. Anyway, we get these convection patterns because the photosphere behaves like a gas. Its temperature and density and pressure dominate over the magnetic effects. But that's not to say the magnetic fields can't have an effect on the photosphere. And the most obvious magnetic effect are sunspots. This is where the magnetic field is diving inside and through the photosphere. And it, they turn into spots because the magnetic field actually slows down, it arrests the convection, so there's no hot gas bubbling up, so they cool down. And the magnetic fields become even more important as you go up above the photosphere into areas of the sun which we usually can't see except in very special circumstances. Such as a solar eclipse. This is from 2017. My wife snapped this photo with her Nikon camera. There's no filters or anything on this. This is pretty much what we saw. So by removing the photosphere, you get to see the extended atmosphere of the sun. This is mostly the corona, but between the corona and the photosphere, there is the chromosphere. And while this isn't a great photo, you can, if you zoom in, see this red tinge just beyond the edge of the moon. 
This is a much better picture, letting you easily see the reddish pinkish color. That's from the hydrogen alpha emission. And if you have a telescope which looks just at that, you can see a whole host of detail. So the word chromosphere tells you that this is a, an area about color. And obviously it's shining in this red hydrogen alpha. It also shines in this blue calcium line. Or you can just apply a spectrometer to a solar eclipse and see all the various lines, the hydrogen, the helium, and the calcium. So the chromosphere sits just on top of the photosphere. It's a few thousand kilometers thick, and the atmospheric density drops precipitously. But the temperature, it starts rising. It's a few thousand Kelvin at the bottom. And by the time it reaches the top, you're up to about 25,000 Kelvin. And then above this is the transition region where it turns into the corona properly. So the transition region is basically where the atmosphere goes from being governed by gas laws, by fluid dynamics, you know, density, gravity, pressure, to a magnetically dominated plasma. In the corona, everything's totally ionized, so it doesn't actually emit that much light. The temperatures rise to a million Kelvin or more, and the magnetic fields drive everything, and the magnetic fields are very much part of the sun. The study and modeling of plasmas is called magnetohydrodynamics, because like hydrodynamics defines a fluid, but it's an electrically conducting fluid that can not only sustain currents, but those electrical currents can in turn produce magnetic fields which push the plasmas around because it's conducting. It's very complicated. But of course, with a name like magnetohydrodynamics, you probably understood that already. So the corona is considered to end when it transitions into the solar wind, and this area is called the Alfin surface, after Hans Alfin, who was a you know, one of the pioneers of plasma physics. And one of the things that he calculated was the velocity of waves that travel through plasma, alphane waves. So now if you have a, a magnetic field and essentially no plasma, then these waves travel at the speed of light. They're essentially magnetic, you know, electromagnetic waves. But if you add plasma in, the mass of that plasma couples to the, the waves and it slows them down. So the velocity gets lower. So as we go away from the sun, the magnetic field gets weaker and weaker, and the velocity of these waves gets lower and lower. And there comes a point where the velocity of the particles in the gas, in the plasma, is higher than this wave velocity. And at that point, you've essentially transitioned into solar wind, because any waves can't travel back upstream, because it would be waves traveling upstream faster than the speed of sound. So that is like the alphan surface. Once you reach this condition where the, you transition from waves to the solar wind flowing out, that is you left what we call the sun. So to figure out whether they got into this region, the Parker Solar Probe had to measure the strength of the magnetic field and the density and properties of the plasma so they could measure the speed of the alphan waves and the velocity of the solar wind. And this is a series of magnetic field measurements. These are made with the fields instrument. The length of the line tells you how strong the field is and the direction tells you how uh, the direction of it. And the color also tells you if it's pointed inwards or outwards. Now, using observations and measurements from other spacecraft that look at the sun, they can try to propagate these magnetic fields back to where they likely originated on the surface of the sun. Now, you'll notice these orange lines are actually going ahead of the spacecraft. That's because they're being pulled around by the rotation of the sun. But as the spacecraft drops down closer and closer to the sun and starts moving faster, it starts actually running into these and crossing them in the other direction. You'll also notice the magnetic field lines are now getting very large and very strong. Now, they need to combine this data with the plasma density measurements, which are made using the sweep instrument. That is the solar wind, electrons, alphas, and protons investigation. So this uh, image now on the left, you'll see the orbit is green, but now it's turning red. And that's the moment when the velocity of the solar wind became lower than the velocity of the alphane waves. And therefore, it crossed this alphane surface and touched the sun. Again, the distinction is important because outside of the surface, the solar wind is moving away from the sun too quickly for any of its wave effects to propagate backwards and affect the surface of the sun. But once inside it, that, there can be changes that happen here that affect the surface of the sun. So it's, it makes sense to say that this is part of the sun. Now, this pass was from April. That was when they passed within 11.1 solar radii. 
They did that again in August, and then there was a flypast of Venus, which dropped the perihelion down to 9.2 solar radii, and that happened in November. We haven't got the data from that yet. There are a total of 16 more perihelia passes planned, and two more Venus flybys will drop the perihelion down to 7.9 radii and then 6.9 radii. At that point, it will be doing 192 kilometers per second at close approach. Now, there's another side to this story. I've been talking about what constitutes this surface of the sun. And the solar wind, of course, continues out. It blows past the Earth. It gives us the aurora. And as it goes further and further out, it eventually starts to run into the interstellar medium, right? The medium, the gas that is being pushed around by the galaxy in general. And the Voyager spacecraft, which were launched in the late 70s, we are still tracking them. And they have returned data showing that they have passed out of the sun solar wind and into interstellar space. We see the heliospheric solar wind just drop off and uh, an increase in the number of cosmic rays from outside the solar system. So the Voyager spacecraft have essentially escaped the sun's influence. And that's a fascinating epilogue to their missions. But Parker Solar Probe remains on its mission and it's getting closer and closer to the sun over time, collecting more data on the environment near this gravitationally bound nuclear fusion reactor that brings life and energy to the solar system. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.